it felt like it's time really to do the tour that we, we knew everyone wanted this tour. Uh, I say everyone, not everyone. <laughs> you know, Bieber fans don't want this tour, I don't think. <laughs> but um, all the people who were around when we came through in the 90s, th this is the tour, I guess, that they've been wanting to happen. And um, I, I've been resistant to do one-off shows with this kind of bill because I felt like they're a bit sort of finite. But the tour itself, that, that's definitely where it's at. That's where it all started, you know. The thing about... The early tours that we did with the Wonder Stuff was that, that that's where we won over a lot of our very first fans. So the songs that we were playing to those people were the songs that essentially kind of got us made. So there's there's a lot of um, love for those those times. Essentially, people wondered back in the day how on earth did Stourbridge produce these three different bands that all wound up internationally famous and you know was there something in the water and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it, it's just absolutely lovely all these years later to be able to call a tour Love from Starbridge, you know. Because it, it was a phenomenon that, that, that occurred, but to us it was just us getting on with doing stuff we loved and people caught on to it. And that, you know, that is just such an amazing thing that occurred that we ploughed our own field, we did our own thing, you know, and I'm sure that knowing other bands and, and the community, if you like, of Starbridge helped all of us out in different ways to kind of together make it make it bigger. But I think the overlying thing about it was that, you know, we, we were determined and we just cracked on and did our thing. And it shows you that that can happen. That can happen for people from, from anywhere, you know. Which venues, you know, it's, it's so much time's passed, I, I can hardly tell which ones are, are the ones that I used to play because they're all O2s now, you know. Um, but um, certainly cities, you know, it's been a long time since we played Glasgow and uh, Glasgow was always a really crazy, crazy place to play. So I can't, can't, can't wait for that one. Um, Newcastle, I haven't played Newcastle for an absolute age and I know that was a that was a stonking crowd there. Um, yeah, and, and and just getting round to cities that we haven't played for ages, you know. Um, yeah, I guess each city would have a would have a story if I could if I could think of them. I remember the Glasgow. Um, that that that's a good one for you because the Hop tour that we did with the Wonder Stuff, the very first Wonder Stuff tour, um, nineteen ninety. Um, the first show was in Glasgow. It was at Glasgow Barrowlands, and we would bought a van for three hundred quid. And this van had broken down about six times on the way to Glasgow just to start the tour. We got to Glasgow and it broke down uh, at the top of a hill in Glasgow and it shed all its horrible stuff down the, the pavements everywhere. But anyway, um, so we went and we played this amazing show. We'd, we'd never played to so many people. It was just a vast, enormous buzz and a shock because we, we just played pubs and things before it. Um, and it comes to the end of the night and we got nowhere to sleep. Uh, it's not in the best part of Glasgow. <laughs> um, we were told, don't sleep in your van. Um, so we didn't know, didn't know what we were going to do. So they, they felt sorry for us at the Barrowlands and they let us sleep in the dressing room. So we slept in the dressing room at Glasgow Barrowlands. And I remember I wrote loads of postcards to, to all my friends and family. Oh, we played this amazing gig, we started this tour, it's fantastic. Um, posted them in the letterbox the night before. Got up the next morning, the letterbox was just black because somebody had just set it alight in the night. And the, the venue promoter said, yeah, that happens most nights. And I remember it was, um, it's fond now. At the time it was weird because um, start of the, the last time we played in uh, Newcastle, it was on our um, Are You Normal tour in 92. And um, at the start of that tour, we'd done a Leicester de Montfort show. And I'd got a little bit overexcited at the start. I'd punched the air and I'd torn all the muscles under my shoulder blade. <laughs> So every night of that tour, I was having osteo and God knows what to try and fix my, my dropped shoulder. Rock and roll. <laughs> anyway, Newcastle, I had a particularly painful manipulation before that show. So I, I, I took a lot of painkillers to try and uh, evade it. And of course, I'm there a little bit less mobile than I normally was. And trying to evade all these people who just landed on the stage, left, right and centre, just keep coming over and wanting a hug. Oh yeah, nice hug. Oh god, my shoulder. <laughs> so it was, yeah, it was, it was 
a little bit mental at Newcastle. <laughs> and at previous times that we'd played there before we got a big tour, we played at the Riverside. And um, that, that was one of those venues where they probably had to rebuild the, the chipboard stage once every two or three weeks because the crowd surges would just break it to pieces and it, there'd be nothing left of it by the end of the gig. So, yeah, it was always a bit mad in Newcastle. Remember we did a support slot with um, Pop Will Eat itself, so the, your other Stourbridge band, and Graham's DJing on this tour for, for us as well, so that's, that's good. We, we supported them at Coventry Poly, and um, we came in all scared, and someone said, oh, we'll show you to your dressing room, and we, we walked past this dressing room, and it was absolutely rammed from top to bottom with crates of beer, beer, more beer, wine, spirits, beer, more beer. And uh, I, I turned to um, our manager and I said, uh, is that, who's that for? Is that for, for like all the bands? He's like, nah, that's just for the poppies. That's just for the poppies. And I, you know, you literally couldn't see where it stopped. It was a sea of alcohol. And um, back in those days, not nothing to be proud of obviously, but back in those days, it was, it was pretty hardcore riders wise and uh, I mean you'd have you'd have the odd stupid thing you'd ask for it's the cliche like you know or we only want orange smarties and we'd never really go crazy with that but we'd in America when, when, when we were touring we'd always have um, five pairs of sports shop socks five pairs of sports socks on the on the rider every single night and what would happen is the poor soul who had to clean the dressing room the following morning would find five pairs of dirty socks so we'd kind of keep ourselves in socks for the whole tour, <laughs> which was quite useful. But shenanigans, uh, Brixton Academy at the end of the Hup tour, we handcuffed the Wunderstoff's guitarist to a stairwell five minutes before he was due on stage. He didn't appreciate that much. Um, and while we were playing our set, um, our press... Um, people had come to the gig because it's London and press people like London, it's nice and close isn't it? So the two two ladies that were our press people came into the dressing room to wish us luck before we went on and uh, Matt the bass player said, uh, it's a nice dress, nice dress you've got on there, can I borrow that? And of course the poor lady's thinking, well you know, I work for him, I can't really refuse. So they, they swapped clothing, Matt did the gig in her dress <laughs> she sat in the dressing room <laughs> to ashamed to, to come out. And when we came back into the dressing room, Matt took off the dress and rang it out into a, a, a cup because he, he, um, he, he more than glozed as Matt on stage and handed her back her dress. He said, oh, cheers, my dears. Thanks for that. Pleasant. <laughs> <laughs>